first and foremost, I want to thank you people for availing yourself this morning. I can see the group is increasing. Uh, I want to also appreciate ISN for having educated me this far. And of course, for the contribution ISN has given to us as Kenyan Association. I did my nephrology at the St. Bosch University and Tigerberg Teaching Hospital with Matthew and others, and Alazin Davids and Rafiq Musa, persons I respect so much. And this morning, I want to engage you briefly on what has happened to us uh, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the influence this has had within the transplant landscape. Um, I've got no interest to declare the company that brought me here, sponsored me here, has no interest in transplantation whatsoever. So I'm free. Uh, we know much more now on COVID-19 than we did uh, last year, last year, but one. I will not go to the details because we know the science of COVID-19, but I want you to appreciate that acute kidney injury is at the center of this pandemic and patients who get acute kidney injury within this COVID-19 story will often have poor outcomes. And this poor outcome is related to the need for vasopressors, mechanical ventilation, and often they will die. And that patients with CKD, excess kidney disease, transplantation, and indeed those who have got glomerular diseases, perhaps because of the treatments they receive, may be at increased risk for infection and associated morbidity and mortality. Now this right, I saw it uh, with Professor Mark Rigel, and of course is a common slide for those who have been reading. It really tells you the various pathophysiological mechanisms under which uh, kidneys suffer in COVID-19. Center to this, of course, is a cytokine storm. Patients or kidneys getting acute kidney injury from ATN, just nephritis, and interestingly, we have observed, or it's in literature, that persons who get various glomerular nephropathies and that high risk apol one gene is again one of the things that's being mentioned. And like Jonathan Noala said yesterday, in days to come, we may see a lot of CKD related to this COVID-19. Now, when COVID-19 came calling, we know what happened. And this acute care injury treatment of course was in a mess. A lot of risks, a lot of challenges, issues to do with access to care, resources, drugs and all that. And the world learned how to go around this. And that's why perhaps I'd say that the outcomes are more predictable than they were uh, last year, last year one. But then we understand much more on acute kidney injury, but we don't know too much on CKD. The only thing we know for real is that people who have got acute CKD are likely to get uh, chronic kidney. I mean, people who have got chronic kidney disease are likely to get um, AKI related to uh, COVID-19. Now, the data on or among patients CKD and end-stage kidney disease is really scarce. But again, like I said earlier, these long COVID survivors or the long COVID patients are going to have huge risks of progression of their disease. And we must always remember that kidney injury is going to be common acutely and chronically, and we must aggressively look out for kidney disease in these persons. Work has been done out there, and this literature is now available. I'm sharing with you a slide which demonstrates or shows uh, a study which looked at outcomes among patients hospitalized with COVID-19 who either had CKD and had stage you know, disease and COVID, I mean, and those ones who are normal. In these patients, one can clearly see that the normal patients or those ones who didn't have CKD being as reference were obviously advantaged. But when you come to patients who had CKD, then one sees something very interesting. Whereas many of us have been thinking 
that people who have got headset kidney disease and on dialysis are likely to die, then this study reports something different. And it says that patients with headset kidney disease appear in this study to have better outcomes than those with non-dialysis CKD. Of course, there are issues to argue here, but this study, of course, is not one study that one can quote and say it's generalized, but it's something for us to think about. Perhaps, again, one would imagine that patients who have got headset kidney disease may have uh, maybe less cytokine storm and may be able to then uh, survive through this. And this is observed by the fact that they had lower C-reactive protein levels at admission, one of the markers of inflammation. This is just one of the things to think about. We may not have, have on local data, but again, as individuals, we have participated in managing patients CKD and COVID, and we know our feelings about this, but this tells you more the controversies that exist on this. Now, what about in kidney transplantation? What have we learned? One of the things that we now know is that presentation of COVID-19 in transplant recipients appears to be similar to that in patients who are not immunosuppressed. Small studies again here and there, but we know that the mortality rate is between 20 and 30%. But again, it's still difficult to conclude whether kidney transplant recipients are at an increase of death from COVID-19. And again, Personally, I've participated in managing quite a number of patients who have been transplanted in COVID-19, and many of them have survived. Um, again, looking into the literature, this very interesting article in Jason tells us that these patients who are likely to die are the ones who, are, who have various comorbidities and asthma, chronic pulmonary disease, among others, have been shown to be independent risks for death among patients who have got COVID-19 and have been post-transplanted. Now, we, we looked at our literature at Kenya National Hospital, and we are still ongoing into uh, understanding our patients. Of the 300 patients we, are, we have been following up, uh, 24 patients, unfortunately, uh, got COVID-19. The mean age for that is as you can see there, 48 years. The median is uh, around 48 with the other statistics as shown there. Uh, again, doesn't deviate much from what we know that males were more likely or are more likely to get COVID-19. Only three patients died. This is not very impressive data in terms of size and numbers. And we didn't do uh, sub-analysis because of uh, the amount of data, but again, this is still works in progress and we shall be reporting to you our observations. But the message is uh, we are still having our patients getting COVID, males are more likely to come to us, but the mortality may not be as high and the fear that we had before may not be as warranted. Now, because of these fears and deaths and all that, the world then sat back and said, do we transplant these persons or not? But then, an advisory came in, and this what is now being practiced, that there is need to be a balance between the benefit of transportation for individual patients and the risks of nosocomial COVID-19 spread for both recipient and donor. In other words, we must not expose these patients to COVID-19. They must not come to hospitals and get COVID-19 in hospitals. And again, there has been this push for individualized decision based on scoring tools. Now we have got I mean, tools that can assist you to score and assess the benefit uh, of transplantation against not transplanting. And these are tools that perhaps we want to look into so that we make uh, rational decisions on transplantation. Of course, the general measures of transplantation, I mean, the general measures of, of trying to contain COVID-19 will apply, but the fact that we need to social distance and all that has pushed the liberty of patients away. We don't want them to come, we want them to stay. And this, among others, has seen a reduction of transplantation rates in the world. Telemedicine, like the one we have been practicing at KNH, from Bastley, both video and tele, uh, telephone, telephonically has been very helpful. And the, most of the world has embraced that right now. And this, again, has been very helpful. But again, 
there has been considerable barriers to telehealth access, and particularly for the low middle income economies, this has not been available, and this has brought out of inequities to transplantation. Uh, but when clinically appropriate, this is, is a way to go. Defer and don't do a lot of laboratory testings, or those which will make your patient come. And for renal biopsy, I don't think there's a time you want to do a lot of renal biopsies. But again, uh, this is not the time to even think about rejection, which uh, would make you want to do renal biopsy because management of this can be very, very tricky at this time. Management of COVID-19 protocols have changed over time. A lot of diversity is there and there and individualization of care. But importantly is that the world has learned that this story of immunosuppression is not the way we used to know it. And we can comfortably now manipulate immunosuppression. Sometimes we even go off completely immunosuppression. And for the number of patients I've taken care of, sometimes uh, they have even come out better in terms of their renal function than they were before, perhaps because of the robust use of steroids and stuff like that. So the point is, we are not as fearful as we were uh, when joking around with this immunosuppression at the end of the time, we want the patients to live. Now, Generally, within all this matrix, many people will reduce, will reduce immunosuppression, the net immunosuppression, importantly targeting the antimetabolites. Uh, and again, depending on the disease situation, uh, come, uh, come down on, to the, on the CNI. For another issue in management is about now whether to treat patients as outpatients or inpatients. But of course, these are decisions that are made uh, in, within programs. Now, the European Association of Urology, in its contribution towards management of transplantation in the world, has come up with risk management guidelines. Again, central to this, again, is the abilities of institutions to handle transplantation. They have come up with three, with three uh, priority groups. The low priority patients who will be deferred or you can postpone transplantation for these six months, uh, provided there's no harm. Then you have got the high priority and emergency category who needs transplantation, and in between, you have got the intermediate category. Now, this one, coupled with the simulated tools I mentioned earlier, would be a better guide for, for people, practitioners of transplantation, to think about in trying to offer transplantation. So basically, we have observed a reduced uh, uptake of transplantation all over the world, and this has been because of scarcity of hospital resources, limited testing abilities and capacity capacities, some institutions still cannot do the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS PCR testings. We do not understand. Sometimes you have got problems with the sensitivities. Many other times we wanted to do a transplant. Then we tested the patient. Yesterday, the patient was negative. Today, we test the patient is positive. All these uncertainties has contributed into us slowing down. And of course, uh, those outcome concerns I, concerns I mentioned earlier of who will live and who will die. Then comes in the ethical issues of transplantation. Again, this has been challenging, but have not yet been addressed. For example, how ethical is it to skip someone on the list because they live with people who are at high risk for spreading COVID-19? It means that persons who live in settlement areas because of the crowding and all that may be pushed off. And then the most affluent people who are able to stay one acre away from each other will get transplantation. These are ethical issues. Is it ethical for hospitals to suppress transplant volumes to maintain ICU beds in that situation for additional future of COVID-19 resource burden. Because often we transplant patients, they get very sick, they go to ICU, they block a bed. So people then will say, oh, wait a minute, transplantation is not that serious. So how ethical is that? How ethical is that we deny patient transplantation when you know that it's life-saving so that we can save, save, save others? So these are ethical issues that need to be tackled and the world is still out there looking for, for solutions for this. Stock and others have recently commented in transplantation journal, and this is what they are saying. Programmatic decisions about transplantation will weigh more heavily on distributive justice, beneficence and non malficence than respect for autonomy. Who benefits more and, and others without harming them is what we are saying. Ethical issues here, which needs to be addressed and indeed very, very important. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has ad adversely affected the landscape of global transplantation, and there's been a need to change protocols during the pandemic. Uh, equity and access to kidney transplantation has been influenced by economics, 
and has adversely affected uh, the low middle income countries like ourselves. Vaccine equity has been a major challenge. We have been pushing and pushing our transplant patients must get vaccines and all that. And we all know the story of vaccines. Uh, the influence of the pandemic in ethical and in ethical and unethical practice is a thing we need to every day consider. Uh, these challenges exist and need to be addressed. And as you know, transplantation science is evolving and it's still works in progress. And let's see what happens. Asante Nisana. Thank you very much.